Thank you everyone for being here uh, on this rainy day <laughs> in Abu Dhabi. It's my first time here. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I want to obviously begin very briefly by thanking the organizers at uh, New York University, Abu Dhabi, and Tamakin as well for their invitation and for making it possible for me to be here and, and to speak with you this evening. Um, I'm going to briefly start by describing my uh, journey, I guess, my, uh, where I come from, how I uh, have got to where I am today, and then I understand there'll be some time for questions, um, and uh, hopefully you won't be shy, feel free to, to ask away. So I'm going to start by briefly describing synesthesia. Synesthesia is a, a neurological phenomenon, and it occurs in maybe 4% of the population. And we know today that it is much more common uh, in people who are highly creative, so writers and painters and musicians tend to be synesthetic, for example, more synesthetic than in the general population. And we also know that synesthesia is more common among uh, people who are on what we call today the autistic spectrum. And that's my case, I was born um, back at the end of the 1970s in London um, and uh, we didn't know at the time what high functioning autism was um, and but we knew obviously that I was different my mind was different in some way because of how I interacted with other people I always felt growing up that English wasn't my mother tongue even though in reality my parents only spoke English at home and at school all of my education was in English but even so I always felt that when I spoke in English I had an accent that the children didn't understand me I was talking more like a book than like a child because I was going to the library every day and I was looking at novels and looking at the dialogue in novels, what's wonderful about literature in whatever language it appears, whether it be English or French or Arabic, is that it's a, a window onto the, onto the world, onto the wider world and onto the human mind. And the best writing opens very wide this window onto how different people perceive the world in different ways. In my case, I was looking to dialogue because I didn't know how to converse with my schoolmates. I was unsure of how to use conversation. For most people, this is something you don't even have to think about. It just is innate. It's instinctive, intuitive. But for me, it wasn't. So I would go to novels. I would look at the dialogue. I would be able to read people's minds. It's the only way that I was able to do this to look and see how people are talking and anticipating each other in the story. And then I would go the next day into the playground with the dialogue in my head and I would try to use it. And of course it didn't work very well because the context isn't the same in a book from the 19th century, for example, something out of Tolstoy or out of, uh, uh, out of Charles Dickens and something in the late 20th century in a playground in London didn't work at all. And I would blame the writing. I would say the dialogue is lousy, it's not good enough. The writer doesn't know how to write dialogue, I need to find a better writer. And I would go back to the library and search among the bookshelves and try to find a different writer who wrote better dialogue and bring that back to the playground and start again. But gradually what happened is this experience did help me to feel more confident in my ability to learn from my mistakes. And all the while that this was happening, I was experiencing the world in what I consider as being my native language. In the shortest way of saying this, it would be to say numbers, but that's not really what it is. It's how I see numbers synesthetically. And how I see numbers synesthetically is a, a language, a visual language made out of shape and colour and texture and emotion. 
And numbers are the closest way I have to describe what I'm doing in my head. I remember the first time that it snowed in London. I was a small child. I was looking out the window. It would have been in December or January. I was born in January. And I saw these white flakes falling to the ground. And after an hour or so, all the grass was white with snow. I knew the word snow. I had read enough, I had heard enough English, so I could say to my parents, it's snowing. But in my head, I wasn't using this word. I was using a picture, which is the closest I have to describe it, is the number 89. The number 89 is a prime number, it means you can only divide it by itself and one. But for me, this number is like flakes falling to the ground in a way that resembles very much snowfall. So I said to myself, 89, or rather the shape that I could see in my mind and looked so much like the snow falling outside, I realized that there was this strange relationship between the world inside me and the world outside. And I wanted to find ways of building bridges between the two. So I would uh, think about this. What am I thinking? Am I thinking in English at all? Or am I thinking and feeling in, in something like numbers? When I'm looking at snow, do I see snow or do I see the number 89 as I see it? And I realized that I was bilingual in some ways. I was both able to converse as best I could in English, which was the parents, my parents' language, the language I was raised in, schooled in, and at the same time I was expressing myself to myself, at least, in this numerical language. I was like the number four, because four is shy, and I was like this number, I was shy. I was also fascinated by beauty, whether it was in a beautiful sentence in a book or a beautiful landscape, whether it was an experience of beauty itself, like in this first trip to Abu Dhabi, seeing the, the beautiful landscapes or the, the wonderful mosque. The beauty of these places reminds me of the number 11, because 11 is such a beautiful, round, shining shape, like somebody holding up a lantern in the dark. And so I was experiencing all of this and saying to myself, do other people think like this? Do other people imagine the world as I do? At the beginning I thought, yes. I saw no reason to imagine that I was doing what other people didn't do. And very quickly I realized at school that this wasn't the case that I was doing sums in a way that was different to other children. And I couldn't explain how I was figuring it out. I was using the colors and the shapes in my head. And when I came to learn languages, whether it was French or German, I was using the colors in the words uh, to make new connections. For example, in French, words that begin with the sound lu all have something to do with light. They're like the number 11 to me. Lumière is the French word for light itself. But the moon is lune. My glasses reflecting the light that you see are called lunettes. And even the chandeliers, like in the mosque that I visited yesterday, are called lustre. So all of these words have the same patterns. And I almost imagine that when we are born, we all have this capacity. We are all synesthetes. Simply, we lose this ability very early. And there are two reasons for that. Firstly, because of how the brain works. We are born with too many connections. And sometimes these connections go wrong. That's why the brain naturally, in its earliest years, prunes back, cuts down on the numbers of connections. When that doesn't happen, as in my case, 
you get epilepsy. And it's true that for some years as a child, a young child, I had epileptic seizures. And luckily, the medicine was good enough to cure me later of these. The second reason that we lose this ability, and I believe that this ability is behind the ability to learn our native language fluently, tens of thousands of words in the space of a few years with no formal education, that comes later. But you have to have language before you have the formal education, not afterwards. The second reason is education itself. It goes both ways. On the one hand, it helps the language to become more formal, to become more structured, to ensure that we understand each other using grammar, rules and so on. At the same time, schooling is necessarily limited. There is one curriculum for 30 different types of minds in a single classroom. And the teacher naturally has only so much time and only so many resources. So what tends to happen is a child very quickly, whether consciously or unconsciously, decides to go with the flow. If they see words in colors, if they experience numbers of shapes, they tend to forget about it. They realize they will never fit in if they think in this way. And after a while, it's as if it never existed at all. For me, being a little bit different, a little bit apart from the other children, allowed me not to have any sort of social pressure at all. I preserved this ability, and it has enriched my life to this day. When I was uh, at school, I remember I had great difficulty interacting with people for many years. I didn't know how to look people in the eye or how to tell a joke. These were things that were difficult for me, and I had to learn them consciously, step by step. But I was very good at studies. I loved reading, I loved studying. When I finished my schooling, I realized that I, there was something that I needed to do, and that was to travel. I hadn't traveled before. And I decided I would go overseas. I joined a volunteer program, and I was sent to a part of Europe that was formerly the Soviet Union. It's what we used to call the Iron Curtain. So I went behind the Iron Curtain for almost a year. I was 19. My parents were very nervous, as you can imagine, all on my own. And when I was over there, I had to teach English. Can you imagine? For me, it was like a foreign language. For them, it was certainly a foreign language. But maybe for that reason, it worked. And in fact, I almost feel to this day that it was as much my students who taught me English as I taught them. Because for the first time, I realized that I could converse in English. I could understand how to go back and forth. And because the students weren't native speakers themselves, they were more understanding. They were more tolerant of my eccentricities. You know, I was eccentric in some ways, but they thought it's just because I'm British. And that was a wonderful excuse that I've used a few times since. And so I spent this year, and it was a very formative experience. And all the time I was thinking about the future, how am I going to find a way? I'm not going to be able to use Lithuanian in the future, even though it's a beautiful language, or French or German, not in itself. How am I going to find a way really to find my voice, to express what I've lived through, and to make people understand perhaps also the potential of their own minds. And I thought back to my earliest years, to the idea of snow, seeing snow, seeing the number 89, how I felt shy as being like the number four and the shape that I saw for this, or the, the shape of the lantern for the number 11, the beauty in the number 11, the light. And I said to myself, my first language is numbers. And it just came to me that I should use the most famous number in the world, which is the number pi, P. And if I could only learn enough of this poem, because for me, this is like a poem, like the Iliad or the Odyssey, 
a wonderful poem. I know in this part of the world you have amazing poetry. Well, this is like a wonderful poem written in numbers, the number pi, and it's an infinite number. It goes on forever and ever. Even if you had paper as big as this room, which is very big, or even as big as the whole of Abu Dhabi, or even as big as Europe or the world or the universe, you would never have enough paper to write all of the numbers of pi. So I was fascinated by this number. I fell in love with this number. And I decided one winter, like an actor, learning a script by heart, to learn this number. And I learned it because the numbers spoke to me. They weren't just numbers, they weren't just squiggles on the page. They had shapes and colors and textures. And when I put those together, they formed a story in my mind. They formed just whole poetry. And I felt completely submerged by the experience. It was like I was learning Pi, but almost as though Pi was learning about me as well and it was a very humbling, beautiful, immersive experience. In 2004, at the age of 25, I went to Oxford. It's one of the most famous cities in the world for learning, of course, with the university there. And at the Museum of the History of Science, I was in front of a a blackboard on which equations had been written in chalk by Albert Einstein. And I sat there for five hours and I recited this beautiful poem in numbers, Pi. And there were people like you this evening who came and listened because there had been a big article in the Times of London. They were very curious, who is this young man who speaks in numbers? And what is it like to listen to Pi, this beautiful poem, as he calls it? And they heard how the numbers were not being spoken like a computer in a monotonous, flat tone, like a calculator spitting out digits. But it was a human being, a young man, who had lived through many experiences, who had battled through loneliness and incomprehension and fear, but also had known joy and love and moments of happiness as well, and was able to find the words for all of these experiences in the numbers of Pi. And so I spent those five hours and nine minutes, that's the time it took me, in front of an audience of all kinds of people, teachers, doctors, mathematicians, but also simply housewives and uh, grocers, people from everywhere. They came and they listened because pi is a universal number. It belongs to everyone, like all great poetry. And they realized that I was changing with the number. Every time the number got very heavy with nines, very dark and violet or black with, or blue with sevens and eights, I would slow down and the recitation would become more hesitant. And then when there were suddenly lots of more ones and sixes, I would get quicker. The numbers would be lighter on my tongue. And it would be like listening to an orchestra which suddenly changes to violins and guitars and flutes. And they were listening and because in Pi is an infinite number, you have every sequence of numbers possible somewhere. So they were listening and they were finding their telephone number. I was reciting their telephone number without them realizing it or their password, their passcode. And they were hoping nobody else noticed that this was their passcode. Or I was reciting the day and the month and the year that they were born. And in maybe one or two cases without realizing it, I was doing the same for the day of their future death as well. So Pi is universal, like all great poetry, and it changed me completely and forever. I realized that day that whatever invisible wall had separated me from other people had disappeared in those five hours and nine minutes. And in that time, I had become the spokesman for infinity, for eternity.
And this can only be a transformative experience. Many people who were there on the day said it was almost like a religious or a spiritual experience. And some of them even had tears in their eyes. This could not do anything other than move me profoundly, as you can imagine. And I realized that if I had a gift, it was not simply to count, but to recount. And I realized I had the vocation to become a writer. In the years since then, I have traveled all around the world, and my books have followed me. They have been translated into 25 languages, from Spanish and Portuguese, all the way to Turkish and Japanese and Chinese and Korean, in alphabets that I don't read, but which fascinate me, because they tell me that every mind perceives differently and has different riches to bring to others, if only they can find their own words to do so. And in my poetry, which I also write, I'm trying to find the words, so that for the time that people immerse themselves in my books, or in my poems, they too become synesthetic. They learn to see the world in colors, and shapes, and textures, and emotions. I want to share with you one poem to finish before we have a few minutes for questions. This is my latest book, it's called Portraits, and it's all about people that have inspired me. Portraits of people that I've known personally, or I've only known about from history, people who are famous or anonymous, men and women, and it's a bilingual book in English and French, not in numbers, although there are numbers on every page, of course. And the poem is called The Universe and Me. It's a poem, really, that's about everyone. Once a year, we inhabit a birthday universe, 14 billion and 38 years in expanse. 14 billion, one estimate, since the Big Bang, to which I add my brief time on Earth. I raise my gaze to the sky and contemplate this number, which frightens and oppresses us all. Our love lives, in comparison, make us remember that we are creatures infinitely small. And yet within me, a distant spring continues to live, ever surprising. Of this, the universe knows nothing. Galaxies and human beings occupy different time zones. I was born 10 years after Neil Armstrong's lunar adventure. What a sight for posterity's eyes. The astronaut appeared timeless. He was 38. I know I'm living on borrowed atoms. I see them. Where do I walk on a sunny day? The carbon in trees, the silicon in windows, the hydrogen in my coffee. I'm a spaceman. Ashes to ashes, stardust to stardust. What is a lifetime? Moments suspended in infinity. The music of wind in the trees, windows framing smiles, the warm, earthy smell of coffee. Everyday moments by the thousand, by the million, billion, 14 billion, and more besides. Thank you.